Our air conditioner dies. The power grid fails. Suddenly, 95 degrees feels like slow torture. But medieval people, they laughed at heat waves without a single watt of electricity. These aren't quaint historical footnotes or primitive guesswork. They're battle-tested cooling systems that kept people alive through centuries of scorching summers. Systems so effective that modern engineers are scrambling to rediscover what peasants took for granted. As blackouts become the new normal and energy bills crush household budgets, these forgotten medieval cooling hacks aren't just interesting. They're becoming essential survival knowledge that your smart thermostat can't replace. One, stone cold truth. Your modern house is a heat trap designed by idiots. Medieval castles were natural air conditioners built by geniuses. Those massive stone walls weren't just for keeping invaders out. They were sophisticated temperature regulation systems. Six feet of limestone doesn't just sit there. It actively absorbs heat during the day and slowly releases it at night. Your drywall can't compete with physics. Medieval builders didn't need engineering degrees to master thermal mass. They observed. They adapted. They created buildings that maintained comfortable temperatures while your one power outage away from heat stroke. The stone selection wasn't random. Limestone and sandstone weren't just available. They were thermal batteries with microscopic air pockets creating natural insulation. Your advanced synthetic insulation falls apart in decades. There still works after 800 years. Medieval homes featured cooling corners, spots where intersecting stone walls created naturally cooler microclimates. The family didn't whine about the heat. They simply moved daily activities to these cooler zones as the sun traveled across the sky. Adaptation instead of desperation. We abandoned this knowledge for cheap, fast construction. Now green architects charge premium rates to discover principles that medieval masons considered basic knowledge. The arrogance of progress often means forgetting what already worked perfectly. 2. Desert Ice Makers Medieval Persian engineers maintained ice in 110 degrees desert heat while your freezer fails during a three-hour blackout. Feel inadequate yet? Their cooling system combined wind catchers, badgers, and underground water channels, canets, into a network so effective it maintained ice houses in the desert without a single moving part. No electricity, no fuel, no maintenance, just architectural intelligence that understood airflow before aerodynamics was even a word. In cities like Yazd, entire neighborhoods stayed comfortable while using zero energy. The system was so effective that ice houses, yakshals, stored winter ice throughout summer with minimal melting. Desert ice storage without refrigeration. Meanwhile, your power flickers and you panic about the ice cream melting. Modern implementations of these principles have reduced cooling costs by 60 to 80 percent in contemporary buildings. The technology requires no electricity, has zero carbon footprint, needs minimal maintenance, and operates silently. Your noisy, energy-guzzling AC unit suddenly seems primitive by comparison. We call ourselves advanced while reinventing technology that already existed centuries ago. Maybe the real progress would be admitting we've been moving backward. 3. The Ceramic Cooling Revolution Your refrigerator needs electricity, freon, and regular maintenance. Medieval people cooled their food and drink with a piece of clay and basic physics. The Botijo and Alcaraza unglazed ceramic vessels used throughout medieval Spain weren't just water containers. They were ingenious evaporative cooling devices that could drop temperatures by as much as 20 degrees using nothing but porous clay and the laws of thermodynamics. When water molecules evaporate, they steal heat. One gram of evaporating water removes 580 calories of heat from its surroundings. Medieval craftsmen didn't need thermodynamics textbooks to master this. They optimized clay composition specifically for cooling, controlling porosity to maximize the effect without wasting water. Entire cooling zones were built using this principle. In medieval Spain, wall recesses filled with porous vessels turned whole sections of homes into natural air conditioners. No moving parts, 
no power source, no maintenance schedule, just elegant, effective cooling that worked for centuries. We've lost this knowledge so completely that modern consumers now pay hundreds for plastic evaporative coolers that break within years, while ceramic versions functioned for decades. Progress isn't always moving forward. Sometimes it's rediscovering what we arrogantly discarded. 4. Sleep survival. You toss and turn in summer heat, blaming your mattress, your partner, your hormones, everything except your fundamental ignorance of cooling techniques medieval peasants mastered centuries ago. Unlike our fixed bedrooms, medieval sleeping locations migrated seasonally. In the summer, people would sleep on the lowest level of the house, what we now call basements, where the ground kept things about 10 to 15 degrees cooler than the upper floors. They didn't fight nature, they worked with it. Their summer beds weren't memory foam heat traps. They used woven reed mats over elevated frames, allowing air circulation beneath and around the sleeper. In Mediterranean regions, these platforms kept bodies 12 to 118 inches above the floor, precisely in the coolest air layer of the room. They understood convection before it had a scientific name. The genius element was the medieval cooling sheet. Linen fabric soaked in water, wrung until barely damp, then spread over the sleeper. As water evaporated, it pulled heat from the body throughout the night. This night cooling provided hours of comfort during the hottest nights while you're spending hundreds on cooling mattress toppers that underperform. They even mastered timing. Medieval texts detail specific schedules for opening and closing windows based on season and time creating natural ventilation cycles optimized for their buildings. You probably open your windows at exactly the wrong time, trapping heat instead of releasing it. The medieval cooling pillow, linen filled with buckwheat hulls, provided natural heat dissipation where your memory foam traps body heat like an insulator. Their technology wasn't primitive. It was perfectly adapted to work without external power sources. Yours fails the moment infrastructure does. 5. Underground Cold Chain Your refrigerator dies and you panic about food spoilage. Medieval people maintained fresh food through months of summer heat without a single watt of electricity. The medieval cool chamber wasn't just a hole in the ground. It was a carefully designed food storage system that kept temperatures between 45 and 55 degrees all year, cool enough to keep food fresh for weeks or even months during the hottest summers. These chambers feature double wall construction with ventilation channels, creating continuous air circulation. Incoming air passed through narrow shafts, often flowing over water features that pre-cooled it through evaporation. They weren't just storing food, they were creating microclimates. The most sophisticated versions incorporated cold wells, vertical shafts below the main chamber that trap the coldest air, which naturally sinks. Food requiring lowest temperatures would be lowered into these wells using rope and pulley systems. Medieval refrigeration zones without compressors or coolant, these weren't just for the elite. Archaeological evidence shows even modest medieval homes incorporated versions of this technology. Keeping food fresh wasn't a luxury, it was survival knowledge passed through generations. The temperature stability was remarkable. Monastery records show that the temperature inside only varied by about 8 degrees between winter and summer, even though it could swing by more than 60 degrees outside. Your modern refrigerator can't maintain this stability during power fluctuations. Maybe progress isn't always what we think it is. 6. Internal cooling systems. Your sports drink was invented by medieval monks. They just didn't need the plastic bottle or marketing campaign. The foundation was the oxymol, honey water and vinegar in precise ratios. This wasn't just flavored water, it was a calibrated solution that accelerated the body's natural cooling mechanisms through vasodilation, widening blood vessels near the skin to dump heat faster. Your modern electrolyte drink is just catching up to medieval science. Mediterranean versions incorporated mint, melissa, and rosemary not just for flavor, but for their documented effects on thermogenesis and perspiration efficiency. Northern European versions featured elderflower and linden, which modern research confirms contain compounds that improve capillary function. They weren't guessing, they were applying generational knowledge. 
The second jobin of medieval Persia added cucumbers and specific mineral salts, creating an early electrolyte replacement system. Field workers consumed these preventatively, understanding that optimal hydration required more than just water. They had heat stroke prevention down to a science, while modern construction workers still drop from heat exhaustion. These weren't just drinks, they were cooling systems in liquid form. Medieval hospitals prescribed specific quantities and timings during heat waves, with different formulas for different professions based on exposure levels. Their primitive medicine understood personalized hydration centuries before it became a wellness trend. Modern studies confirm traditional second job in preparations lower core body temperature more effectively than cold water alone, exactly as medieval texts claimed centuries before thermometers existed. Maybe we should spend less time inventing new solutions and more time remembering what already worked. 7. Personal Climate Control Medieval Cooling Garments Your moisture-wicking athletic shirt costs $50 and falls apart in a year. Medieval cooling garments lasted decades and outperformed your technical fabrics without a single synthetic fiber. Medieval summer clothing wasn't just lighter winter garments, it was a sophisticated multi-layer cooling system creating personal microclimate management. The outer garments featured specific pleating patterns that created bellows effects, pumping air across the body with each movement. They engineered airflow into the fabric itself. They understood fabric characteristics without material science degrees. Linen wasn't just used for availability. Its hollow fiber structure actively wicks moisture away from the skin faster than cotton, while its smooth surface prevents the sweat-soaked cling that traps heat. Your polyester blend can't compete with their flax. The genius was their layering physics. Light-colored outer layers reflected radiant heat, while specific underlayers created air gaps that provided insulation, not to keep heat in, but to keep it out. This is the same principle used in modern desert clothing, but was understood centuries earlier. They mastered heat management while you're still figuring out what to wear when it's hot. Strategic openings in summer garments weren't decorative. They positioned airflow across the body's high moisture areas, neck, underarms, back, specifically to accelerate evaporative cooling where it's most effective. Their clothing wasn't just covering. It was an active cooling system. Even their dyes were functional. Medieval woad dyed linens block nearly 85% of UV radiation. Comparable to SPF 15 sunscreen, they were protecting themselves from skin damage centuries before we discovered UV radiation. Your ancestors weren't primitive. They were practical geniuses whose knowledge we've arrogantly discarded. Medieval green cooling. Your sustainable green roof is medieval technology with a marketing department. They mastered botanical cooling when your ancestors were still figuring out basic shelter. Medieval Mediterranean courtyards weren't decorative garden spaces. They were sophisticated cooling engines powered by strategic plant placement. Climbing vines on south-facing walls weren't just for looks. They acted as living shade and could lower surface temperatures by as much as 30 degrees. Your modern sunscreen film can't compete with nature's engineering. The plant selection wasn't random gardening. Each species was chosen for a specific evapotranspiration rate is, how much water they release through their leaves. A mature grapevine can transpire up to five gallons of water daily, creating its own microclimate through evaporative cooling. They weren't just growing food, they were growing air conditioners. Monastery gardens featured strategic cooling corridors, pathways where air naturally channeled between buildings, enhanced by specific tree placement that accelerated airflow while simultaneously cooling it through leaf evaporation. They engineered wind patterns centuries before computational fluid dynamics existed. The most sophisticated systems used deciduous vines and trees that provided maximum shade during summer but allowed crucial solar gain during winter months. This wasn't accidental. Medieval agricultural texts specifically note which species drop leaves earliest and which retain them longest. They were programming seasonal cooling responses while you struggle with your programmable thermostat. Even fruit selection served cooling purposes. 
Varieties with high water content were trained against south-facing walls, creating living cooling panels that absorbed solar radiation while converting it to food rather than interior heat. Your passive solar design concepts are just rediscovering what they already knew. We ripped out these living cooling systems for clean visual lines and easy maintenance, then spent billions developing mechanical replacements that consume energy instead of producing food. Maybe progress sometimes means remembering what we foolishly abandoned. Medieval chronological climate control. You fight against nature's heating and cooling cycles. Medieval people synchronized with them and barely broke a sweat. Medieval daily schedules weren't arbitrary, they were sophisticated chronological cooling strategies aligned with natural temperature fluctuations. Dawn work shifts weren't about religious devotion. They capitalized on the coolest working hours while you're still hitting snooze through the most comfortable part of summer days. The medieval biphasic day wasn't laziness, it was climate intelligence. Work halted during peak heat hours, not from lack of discipline, but from practical understanding of human productivity curves under thermal stress. Their workday wrapped around the heat while yours marches straight through it. Productivity plummeting while air conditioning strains to compensate. Cooking schedules followed strict thermal logic. Baking and hearth work happened during pre-dawn hours, allowing food preparation to finish before heat built up. Communal ovens operated on precise schedules, one firing serving multiple families, minimizing heat introduction into living spaces. Your dinner prep turns your modern kitchen into a sauna exactly when outdoor temperatures peak. Even sleeping patterns were heat optimized. The medieval first and second sleep wasn't primitive insomnia. It was a cooling strategy. People slept during early evening, woke during the midnight cooling hours for social activity, then returned to sleep until dawn. This biphasic pattern maximized rest during the coolest hours while you toss in sweat-soaked sheets through the night. Market days and community gatherings weren't randomly scheduled. They rotated based on seasonal patterns, moving earlier in summer and later in winter. Public activities shifted locations seasonally moving to riverside venues or shaded town squares during summer months. They restructured entire social calendars around thermal comfort while you schedule outdoor weddings in July and act surprised when guests suffer. Medieval seasonal migration within homes was systematic. Living spaces rotated through the building as seasons changed. Upper floors in winter for heat capture, lower floors in summer for cooling. Furniture itself relocated seasonally. They didn't fight thermal reality. They adapted to it while you maintain the same living patterns year-round, burning energy to force comfort instead of changing habits. The most sophisticated time-based cooling came from predictive weather knowledge. Barometric indicators like pine cones, seaweed, and joint pain weren't superstition. They were early warning systems, allowing preventative cooling measures before heat waves arrived. They prepared for thermal challenges while you're still surprised by the weather forecast. Your ancestors weren't just surviving heat. They were outsmarting it through chronological discipline that required no technology beyond a sundial. Maybe real climate control isn't about dominating nature with machinery, but aligning with its rhythms through something we've nearly lost. Adaptability. The next time your power fails during a heat wave and panic sets in, remember this. For centuries, people stayed cool without a single electron of electricity. They didn't survive by accident or luck. They mastered heat management through observation, adaptation, and practical ingenuity. The real question isn't whether medieval cooling techniques still work. They do, often better than our modern alternatives. The question is whether we're humble enough to learn from the past instead of arrogantly assuming newer always means better. Your ancestors weren't primitive versions of you. In many ways, they were more resilient, more resourceful, and more in tune with natural systems than we can imagine. Maybe true progress isn't inventing new dependencies. It's remembering how to live without them. When the grid fails and temperatures rise, who will really survive better? The medieval peasant with practical cooling knowledge or the modern consumer who can't function without a working outlet?